We had the introductory comments to the book of Jeremiah, and now we are launching straight into chapter 1. Some of those chapters, brethren, are shorter, some of them are longer, but I've decided not to really combine or amalgamate more than one chapter per Sabbath, for the simple reason that there's so much information in all, in each and every chapter of any book of the prophets, including the book of Jeremiah, and we already, in each chapter, there's usually enough material, enough information, enough revelations that we have to contemplate and reflect on. And therefore, I think one chapter by the Sabbath, however short or however long it might be, is totally appropriate. So, uh, I just want to remind you that the name of Jeremiah, the name Jeremiah means whom the Eternal raises up or launches forth. And this book was written, the book of Jeremiah, about 120 years after the Shalmaneser or Assyria took the house of Israel captive. And yet, a part of it applies to Israel after their captivity. We'll be able to discern that from the context. So in areas where it is talking to Israel, this book refers more to the future, not to the past or present time. We'll see that when we read the portions related to the second exodus, for example. It relates to the future, certainly not to the past or present time. Chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the thirteenth year of his reign. Now, from these two verses, brethren, there was, we see there was a Hilkiah. Hilkiah was the high priest. Now, this is not that one. The high priest Hilkiah was of the line of Eliezer, whereas the city of Anathoth belonged to the line of Ithamar, and we can find that back in 1 Chronicles chapter 24. So Jeremiah, along with Nathan and Ezekiel, Jeremiah was among the priests, or he came from the city of the priests, and yet they also were made prophets. So probably Zechariah was in that group as well. Now, of course, the city of Anathoth is one of the cities that was given to the Levites, as it is written in Joshua chapter 21, verse 18. So it is one of the cities of the priests in the land of Benjamin. Then in verse 2, we notice that going over, he skips a couple of the kings that only reigned a couple of months each, three months each, Jehoakas and Jehoakim. So, you see, Jeremiah does not mention them because they were only in rule three months. But, you know, he gives us a summary, a summary showing us that it started in the days of Josiah, and then it lasted through all the kings after Josiah, including the two kings that are not mentioned, all the way down to the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, the king of Judah, and the carrying away of Judah captive in the fifth month, as we will be reading now in verse 3. I just need to remind you again that Josiah was the last king that was righteous, that was the last righteous king that ruled on the throne of David. And then after Josiah came, as we see, these two kings, you see, that were ruling for a very, very short period of time, all the way to uh, the king of Zedekiah, who was the last Jewish king, the last king to rule on the throne of David before he was toppled and carried away to uh, captivity in the Babylon. Now we will read in, in verse 3 that uh, the summary was given, and now in verse 3 we come to this information. It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the end of the eleventh year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the carrying away of Jerusalem captive in the fifth month. So we learn a lesson here that God may not in every place include all the individuals. So, you know, critics might say, well, look, look at how inaccurate Jeremiah is. He just lists these three and talks about them only and skips over a couple of kings as if he didn't know that they existed. 
Now, of course, he knew that they existed. And yet, you know, he gets the message across and gives us the historical moment when something began and shows up, shows us when it ended. So we assume that it included all of the ones in between without Jeremiah having to name them. And this might be a good example of how God, brethren, takes the wise in their craftiness. <laughs> in the book of Job, chapter 5, and verse 13, it says that he catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the cunning comes quickly upon them. You know, they get too smart for God, brethren, and God shows these things to the babes, like us, and he hides them from the wise and the crafty. So God may have done that on purpose here in skipping those kings to name them by name. Again, we read about them in Chronicles and in the book of Kings. We read that they reigned for a very, very short time. We reign, we read how they were uh, positioned in the, on the throne of David, who uh, who instituted them on that throne, how they were removed from that, from that throne, and how their rulership was very short-lived. Now, one little interesting side, li- side light too shows, you see, something you can read, and you can say, oh, how can this be? They came in the fifth month. Then, one other place, it does not have the same exact details. We might notice, for example, chapter 52 in the book of Jeremiah, and verse 12, which says, Now in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, which was the nineteenth year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. And now we might contrast that with 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 8. 2 Kings 25, verse 8, which says, And in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. So either way, if people are not trembling at God's word, you know, they have no awe. If we, if they read something and say, well, I'm not sure I get this, you know, it looks like there are two different things here. Two different things there, you know, how to get this. But, you know, because in one place it says the fifth month, the tenth day of the month, and in the other it says the fifth month, the seventh day of the month. You see, the thing we learn, one, the thing we learn uh, about the scripture, which is mentioned in uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, that one thing that we learn where Jesus says that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the of the mouth of God. Uh, and so, then, how can we understand this? Well, when we compare Jeremiah 52 with 2 Kings chapter 25, we learn that lesson. There is one word that shows the clarification. And there is no contradiction here, brethren. Jeremiah 52, 12 says, The fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, the king of Babylon came into Jerusalem. But back in Second Kings chapter 25, verse 8, it says that in the fifth month, on the seventh day of the month, King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came unto Jerusalem. Unto Jerusalem. So it is obvious that he stayed there three days at the city to which he came, and then he went in. So you see, if we have respect and reverence for God's word, All contradictions are gone and we don't get caught in the snares or traps trying to be too wise and know more than God does, you know. Verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Please notice the plural, nations in plural. Now, when we think about other people that the same statement is made about, that they were known by God before he formed them in the womb of their mothers, we might notice back in Luke, the first chapter, verse 15. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 15. Speaking of Jesus Christ, of course, God says through his angel to Mary, For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord, their God. 
he will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So you see, several people are referred to directly that way. We might remember that Paul was in, that would be in Galatians chapter 1, verse 15 and 16, was referred in a sense in that way. Also Samson, if we read Judges chapter 13, verse 3, was also referred uh, you know, you know, to, to, to directly that way. So apparently, men of God, you know, there are at least these four who were separated for their purpose from the time of birth. Now, of course, Jesus Christ was too, but he is a special category. Cyrus, remember Cyrus the Great, the king of uh, uh, of Persia, he was also separated as well, but he was not the man of God. So if we could count them all, we could say there were seven of them, but four of them were God's men, and the two other were human men, and the other one was Christ. So the numbers are, <laughs> you see, always present. And you'll see that throughout the book of Jeremiah. It would be, I think, perhaps a new revelation to many. Or, you know, it could be good fun for our children to count all various things. Three, four. And uh, it's amazing how God reveals himself. You'll see through the book of Jeremiah in number four. Now in verse five, we also get one of the first keys of the purpose of Jeremiah. Because it says, I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Now, he was ordained a prophet unto the nations, again plural. So, he is not a prophet to Judah, neither is he just a prophet to Israel. God had ordained him a prophet unto nations. Verse 6. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. (laughs) You know, we have to know the right Hebrew word here. To arrive to the correct age in the bracket. The Hebrew word is Nahar, which means, which means, which would mean a youth. So he may have been up to 21. Because that was the age considered to be adult. King Josiah, you might remember, began to reign when Jeremiah was eight years old. So this was in the 13th year of his reign. So Josiah would be 21. So Jeremiah may have been about 20 or 21 by the Hebrew term here. Well, we know, we know how many men, you know, how many men tried uh, to get out of what God was <laughs> calling them to do. <laughs> when God calls them, you know, many men try to just get away. So some say, well, I'm not an eloquent man. I'm just a sheep herder and I'm not a priest. Some say, well, I'm a child, I'm just too young. Others say, I don't want to go to Babylon, I have never been there, you know, like Jonah. Jonah didn't want to go to <laughs> to Nineveh. So you see, everybody tries to get away and get out of there except, uh, except the world. This world never tries to get away from whatever they consider to be their revelations, and they try to convince us that it was all that they were given as a commission from God, brethren. And then, you know, everybody tries to get into the ministry, trying to get to get in into the preaching, trying to get into a kind of internet ministry, into a broadcast or telecast or whatever. They just, you try to get in. But better in the Bible, those real men of God, they always try to back off. They try to back out of it. They try to escape it, you know. But they got drafted and they could not help it. The same is with, you see, Jeremiah. Because in verse 7, But the Lord said to me, Do not do not say, I am a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. So, you know, that put, put an end to that, you know. God just said, you are going to do it. You know, Paul said if he didn't do it willingly, then he would have a stewardship. So he was likewise in the same boat with Jeremiah. Now he says the next thing, he knew humanly you do, you know. Verse 8, because we would be afraid, you see. Because humanly we are all afraid of such a commission indeed. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. 
So you see, God knew that that would be the next tendency or the next excuse Jeremiah could come up with. He knew Jeremiah could or would say, but Lord, look, look at those people. They're not going to listen. They don't listen to you. They're going to be hard-headed and stubborn. So God said, you know, uh, God said, do not be afraid of their faces uh, and uh, their angry and mad faces. God says, do not be afraid for I am indeed with you. I'm not going to leave you nor forsake you. Then comes verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Now something similar happened also to the prophet Isaiah, except that it was an angel who came down with burning coals and touched his lips with the coal, coals showing what he said would be clean and purified, it would be from God. And that is what men of God are always supposed to speak. Ezekiel is told the same thing. We might notice in Daniel chapter 10, verse 16, showing again the harmony of the books of prophecy. Let's notice following Daniel 10, verse 16. And suddenly, one having the likeness of the Son of Man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrow have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. You might remember that Daniel had a horrible visions of those horrible four beasts, the four, four world-ruling powers in the world, of which the last one was the most horrible one. That's the power, brethren, we are seeing right now, rising here in Europe, the last, very last resurrection of the holy, so-called holy Roman Empire. So this section of the scripture also shows that this phenomena happened to each one of them, to Isaiah, to Jeremiah, to Ezekiel, and to Daniel. And you know, that is unique because Daniel is one of the prophets, not like the Jews class him as one of the writings. You know, that fouls up the whole system if he is listed among the writings and not among the prophets. Yet, he has the main foundations of prophecy. As far as the basic outline, we get that out of Daniel. So Daniel is one of the four. He was dealt with exactly like Jeremiah. The Eternal put forth his hand and touched his mouth. Verse 10, See, God says to Jeremiah, I've, set, I've, I've this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to plant. Now again, notice the plural in the term, the nations and the kingdoms. You see, brethren, it implies large groups of countries Jeremiah was going to deal with. Now we see the word kingdoms is combined of kingdoms. Because various kingdoms allied together, maybe like Europe today. But God said Jeremiah over nations and kingdoms to root out and pull down and to destroy and to throw down and to build and to plant. Now, some people that want to attack the core belief of the Church of God about the house of Israel, they try to attack that scripture saying, well, that is not saying that Jeremiah was not there to talk about Judah being brought down and then take the king's daughters and raise them back up in the British Isles. Can that mean root out, pull down, build up and plant? Well, yes, let the Bible interpret the Bible. How does the Bible use these terms? Interestingly enough, the word set you actually means install. Not just appoint, but install for that very purpose. In other words, brethren, God installed Jeremiah. God set Jeremiah. Not only did he appoint him as the prophet to prophesy these very things. Now, what nations and what kingdoms did God install Jeremiah to root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, build and to plant? Well, now, if, if he took the king's daughters to Egypt and then to the British Isles, then literally, he literally did what this says. Root out, pull down, build and plant. We might get a glance at some of the other passages. We might notice Ezekiel chapter 17, starting in verse 22. Ezekiel 17, verse 22. Thus says the Lord God, I'll take also one of the highest branches of the high cedar and set it out. I'll crop off 
from the topmost of its young twigs, a tender one, and will plant it on a high and prominent mountain. Now when we read that, and we are still talking about taking the highest branch of the highest cedar, cropping off, off from the young twigs, a tender one, planting it on a high mountain, on a prominent mountain, on the mountain height of Israel, I will plant it. On the mountain height of Israel, so it is not talking of a Gentile kingdom here at all. He's talking about the mountain height of Israel. And he says, God says very clearly, I will plant it. So Israel is an imminent noun. It is a high mountain and it is one to which he is going to take a tender one from among the young twigs that he cropped off from the top and he is going to plant it. And it says, and it will bring forth boughs and bear fruit and be a majestic cedar. Under it will dwell birds of every sort. So by the planting of this young tender twig, a tree developed which Daniel interprets as a world empire that produced fruit, which means it provided nourishment, prosperity and blessing for a lot of countries that were under its protection. That's exactly what is meant, brethren. And so the Bible again is interpreting itself. There is no need for us to be confused by whatever critics that might arise and that might just try to confuse us. So... Uh, all kind of other countries, pictures as different birds in their descriptions, dwelled under that tree. Because it says, in the shadow of it, of its branches, they will dwell. Now, in the end, and ultimately, all the countries, all the trees of the field are going to know that the Eternal, as it says here, has brought down the high tree and exalted the low tree, dried up the green tree and made the dry tree flourish. I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. So, in the same sense that Jeremiah was going to be set over nations and kingdoms to root out, pull down, destroy, throw down, build up and plant, which he did literally with the king's daughters, he also was going to do the same thing with other kingdoms and nations. So, we want to look for that as we go through the book of Jeremiah. God set him, ordained him a prophet unto the nations, plural. And verse 10 in chapter 1 tells more specifically that he was going to prophesy of them being rooted out. Now brethren, some kingdoms and nations, if they are rooted out, they don't exist anymore. That's logical. If you destroy them, if they, if they, you know, get rooted out, if they, if their kings get removed, toppled, those nations will not exist anymore, right? That's, I guess that makes sense. So somewhere in Jeremiah, he is going to tell us about kingdoms and nations that were rooted out, that don't exist today. They used to be and they don't exist now. Some were not to be rooted out, they were just going to be pulled out. Some are going to be destroyed, and the Hebrew word does not mean obliterate and cease to exist. It means to be brought down from its position previously and be thrown down. But also, brethren, from among these nations that he is going to prophesy of rooting out and pulling down and destroying, some are going to be built and planted. So, they will be built and planted either in another area, after they come back from captivity, or after they come back from captivity in their own area. Of course, I'm alluding to the house of Israel. After captivity, the house of Israel, as you rather know, will be planted again in its own promised land. But some nations, they were pulled out, they were not of Israel. They were, you know, either to be planted in another area. So those are the two key verses we want to see fulfilled as we go through the book of Jeremiah, verse 5 and verse 10. Then, in verse 11, another prophecy. Here is another prophecy, or I might better say, the beginning of another prophecy. Verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see a branch of an almond tree. 
Now, most people don't realize that the almond tree is the first to wake from the winter sleep. It is just like the rooster crowning, awakening the morning first among the birds, you know. Sometimes it's very early in the morning and when it just sounds, it's, you know, sounding, we're like, oh, why don't you go back to sleep, you little bird? In any case, in the same sense, any watcher or a servant of God is going to be the first one to tell things, the first one to warn about things, like a staff being a symbol of a prophet or a servant of God. This particular Hebrew word for branch is makel. Makel, and it is generally a rod of striking, not just a rod for walking only. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 17, verse 17 has the same word being used again. Also, in Genesis chapter 30, verses 37 through 41, that part of the scripture also contains the same word. So, here is a prophet pictured as being sharp and alert and early in the morning on the job to be the first one to let anything to be known with this prophet's rod. Verse 12, Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am ready to perform my word. And the word of the Lord came to me the second time, saying, What do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot. And it is facing away from the north. Now, we find this north and north and north. And we find, you know, always uh, that the threat to the modern house of Israel always comes from the north. Uh, that's what the prophecy, of course, tells us. So Jeremiah is consistent with the other prophecies. So we are going to find over and over and over again in Jeremiah that he's going to tell us where the captor, the enemy, the power that is going to take the house of Israel captive, that it is always out of the north, brethren. Always out of the north. It is not out of the east. And I'm saying this because of this consistent false propaganda against Russia all the time, which is being prominent in the British and, and, and American and other media. Brethren, the house of Israel, in which many of you, most of you live, the house of Israel is going to be taken captive uh, or, or from the power that will be rising on the north, not of the east. Not the Japanese, not Chinese, not Russians, nor the people of India. It is always, it has always been the north. It will always be, it is always, it has always been the north. And it is, it has always been the north and it will continue to be the north. It's north, north and north. So, brethren, it is always north. It has never been the east power that is going to overtake and crush the rebellious house of Israel. So, dismiss all this false propaganda against Russia, even against China. The main threat to your lands is coming from the north. It's coming from the German-led United States of Europe. Now, we may ask the question, how could it be out of the north back at that time when it was Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon? And then how, it, it, how is it going to be out of the north in the end time? It's a good question indeed. But again, there is no contradiction. Now, of course, the armies ended up coming over and coming down from the north, even they when they invaded the ancient house of Israel in its promised land. In the old days, of course, in the Old Testament. But we are going to find the term north over and over and over and over and over as we go through the book of Jeremiah. If you're marking your Bible, I would suggest that you circle the word north so that you can perceive the power Jeremiah is referring to. So here is a boiling pot. And who is going to be boiled in that boiling, in this boiling pot? Well, but it's obvious the power that is going to do the boiling is the power out of the north. So the prophet hasn't told us yet who is going to be boiled in the pot. He just is telling us who is going to do the boiling. The Hebrew word literally means the pot blown upon or blowing on the fires to make them hotter. Hebrew word is naf nafach. Verse 14, then the Lord said to me, 
Out of the north, calamity shall break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. So you see, just like the people of the promised land, a power out of the north, if we go north of the promised land, of course, we are going to end up in Europe, in the countries of that area. So out of the north, an evil is going to break forth. So just like a forest fire breaks out of control, or like water in a flash flood breaks forth, it suggests the book of Revelation, it is going to come, in the book of Revelation it says it's going to come quickly, unexpectedly. People are going to be stunned and shocked and surprised about it. And no wonder. No wonder because they're constantly being fed with this propaganda that the main threat to your lands of modern Israel, to Canada, Australia, uh, British Isles, New Zealand and America is coming from the east. No, brethren, it's coming out of the north. Out of the north, calamity will break forth on all the inhabitants of the land. Now, who is going to make up this power of the pot, the power of the north, which will bring this evil that is going to be boiling someone in this pot? Who? Verse 15. For behold, I'm calling all the families of the kingdom of the north, says the Lord. That is a key phrase, brethren. We need to know that somehow either by circling the term, all the families of the north, all the families of the kingdom of the north will be there. So, they will be the German kingdoms and Italian kingdoms, all the families of the kingdoms that make up the north. All of those families of those kingdoms are going to be called together. So here again, the power that is going to be boiling or that is going to boil the house of Israel, is going to be a combine of nations. And it is going to be all the families of the kingdoms of the north. So combine. What is the European Union? But a combine of various nations, brethren. Then the verse 15 continues. They shall come and each one set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. So here is the first beast that sets its seat and throne upon the mount of God. And then when he sits upon the mount of God, he will sit in the temple of God, will proclaim himself God's representative on earth, that he is God who returned to the earth to take it over. Now it says that uh, they shall come in plural And each one will set his throne. Again, showing that all those kings from the kingdoms of the north have their individual thrones. And yet now they're all united together. They're allied. Verse 15 continues. Against all its walls all around and against all the cities of Judah. Let's go to verse 16. I will utter my judgments against them concerning all their wickedness, because they have forsaken me, burned incense to other gods, and worshipped the works of their own hands. The word wickedness here in Hebrew is word rach, which means bad or evil, morally or naturally. Now the translators obviously do not realize the importance of different words for sin in God's sight. It is important whether we, you know, whether we miss the mark or whether we transgress, or whether we become evil, or whether we become rebellious, you know, our chances of getting out of them are less and less, you know. It's one thing to miss the mark, it's another thing to be transgressing. The other thing is to become evil, and then, you know, ultimately, just like the house of Israel, to become a rebel. Chances to get out of such conditions are less and less as they progress. Now, the word incense here in Hebrew is katar, And it doesn't mean incense only. It is the word that includes all kinds of burnt offerings and all the other offerings. So it is not just incense they burn to other gods. As we all know, they also burn their own children to other gods. And now, brethren, we are going to see who is going to be boiled in the boiling pot. There are people who have known God, There are people who have forsaken God and they go off into idolatry. And they worship the works of their own hands 
which are their houses, their cars, and their idols. So here is verse 17. Therefore, prepare yourself and arise, and speak to them all that I command you. Do not be dismayed before their faces, lest I dismay you before them. Now in Hebrew, this description is more colorful. Those who can read this verse in Hebrew will notice a play of words there. Verse 18, For behold, I have made you this day a fortified city and an iron pillar and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against its princes, against its priests, and against the people of the land. Notice this hierarchy, brethren. Here again, God in poetic beauty emphasizes the individuals who are involved in the corruption that God is going to have to deal with by these captors. So we find against here seven times in these two verses. Against, 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 against. Seven times. First, he's talking about God bringing his power against them, the whole land, the kings, the princes, the priests, and the people. Verse 19, They will fight against you, but they will not prevail against you, for I am with you, says the Lord, to de deliver you. So right in one little section, we have that perfect number seven, brethren, once again, and as I said, there will be a play of words all throughout the book of Jeremiah. We have that perfect number seven once again, partly against the land and people and leaders of God, and then fighting against you, but not prevailing against you because I am with you, says the Eternal, I am with you to deliver you.